Great. Tricia, thank you so much. I want to thank everyone for being on this call. As you know, it is the week before General Conference, and um, we have been making a lot of preparation and consultation with United Methodists all over the world, and so we're really excited to have this opportunity to have a conversation with you today. Um, and toward the end of our time, we'll open it up for questions. Um, and there is, for those of you who are online, you can um, see there is a place to, to note questions. Um, and for those of you who are not online, um, we will open up the phones and, and try to hear questions one at a time. So we're to leave as much information as possible at the end. Um, as Tricia noted, my name is Susan Burton, and I'm Director of Women's and Children's Advocacy at the General Board of Church and Society. And I'm thrilled that today that um, Molly Vickery is joining me. Yes, uh, thank you, Susan, and thank you for um, involving United Methodist Women in every aspect of this piece of legislation and, and um, policy and legislation in general when it comes to women and girls. Um, I'm Molly Vickery. I'm a deaconess serving at United Methodist Women as an executive for children, youth, and family advocacy. So um, thanks again for having us. As, you, as people join us, we'd encourage you to uh, mute your phone using star six or the mute button. Um, sometimes it's noisier on our end than it is where you are, so it may not be that you can hear the noise, but we can. Um, and we want to make sure everybody can hear this and that there are plenty of opportunities for questions. I wanted to, uh, Molly and I talked about this and wanted to start with a little bit of introduction about how this legislation, we, we're going to talk about one particular piece of legislation, but then talk about how is related to the overall work of both United Methodist Women and the General Board of Church and Society, um, and, and how we came to developing this, this legislation. Two years, two years, two and a half years ago, a number of us um, met together to talk about how we would um, move legislation related to women, children, health, and rights forward to General Conference. So United Methodist Women, General Board of Church and Society, Global Ministries and MFSA all got together to say there are all these pieces of legislation set to expire, and we want to make sure that we know who is care, who is tending to these, um, and who's going to make sure that, that they are shepherded, shepherded to um, through our boards so that they can be at general conference. So there were a number of decisions made. The piece of legislation that we're talking about today, eradicating sexual and gender-based violence, was done in consultation, General Board of Church and Society consulted with the General Board of Global Ministries, their community health boards, some of the leaders there, and then other advocates for stopping sexual and gender-based violence around the world. One of the things that we have heard from our Central Conference delegates is that much of the legislation, many of the resolutions, and also the social principles are written from a very U.S.-centric perspective. And so one of the things that we were asked every time we talked about legislation at a church and society board meeting was, how does this relate to all of us, to all United Methodists? And so as we gathered around that table to talk about this, that was one of the main emphases, is how do we make sure that the legislation that we move forward is global in nature? Another example of legislation that came about through this process is the conference of uh, resolution on ending modern day slavery. and. If you're interested in any of these petitions, we can certainly forward them to you, um, and we will send a follow-up email with our email addresses so that you can contact us specifically for that information. But the, um, we worked on the, on the human trafficking petition. We worked closely with United Methodist Women to make sure that um, the, the work that we're doing on trafficking, the work that they were doing on trafficking, um, and the work that United Methodists are doing around the world on trafficking was reflected in that resolution. And again, the goal was to make it global in nature and also make it comprehensive. We have been looking um, at scripture. Probably you've seen these in some of the resources of both Church and Society and United Methodist Women have been working with over the years. But looking at Genesis 1 and focusing on um, the fact that um, that we are all made in the image of God. And so one of the things that I have been wrestling with is I've been in this position where we're talking about domestic violence, sexual assault, um, HIV, AIDS, um, family planning, reproductive health, and um, human trafficking is that my belief is that, that somewhere someone 
thinks that women and girls are disposable and therefore it's okay to exploit and abuse us. And so we are trying to say to the church um, and to the world, absolutely not. Um, we are made in the image of God um, and therefore you cannot dispose of us. We are not, we are not to be treated that way. Um, recently preparing for a training in Liberia, um, my colleague Rose Farhad, who's a pastor there, we worked with this uh, scripture in Second Samuel, where Tamar is sexually assaulted, and the men in her life are remain silent. And we know that happens very frequently. And one of the things that Rose said, and that I put this slide up there that stays with me, is that Rose said you know, that this scripture shows us that God was not okay with violence then, and God is not okay with violence now. And that that is part of the conversation that we want to be having. And so our hope, and, and you'll hear this a little bit later, but our hope for these pieces of legislation is that they will they will not only be something that encourages and calls the church to action, but that they will also be teaching tools that help people think about all the different ways that people are impacted by these issues. The second, the, the third scripture on the list is just one example of the way that Jesus models healthy masculinity, models healthy relationships. And so we look at Jesus and the woman who committed adultery, and I think it's a, for us, it has been a, a great conversation to have looking at King David and Tamar's brothers and Jesus in John 8, 11, and we see this with Jesus a lot, but how Jesus steps up and interrupts systems that are, are oppressing her or hurting her are going to violate her and says, no, we're not going to do this. And I think that that is, that is as we – have been doing this work, we're going to, and you'll continue to hear me say, how do we engage in conversations around healthy masculinity? How do we engage in our lives? And just, just one more reminder, if you please put your phone on mute with star six. That would be really helpful. The last scripture that, that is listed here is John 10, 10, and in our Jesus' commitment that all of us would experience abundant life. And so that will show up again and again because we want to, we want again to create a narrative that, that teaches and models and expects that all women and girls are valued um, because of our abundant life. And I'm, so I know that there's some people who are unable to get online, and so I'm going to read the slides a little bit more than I had intended. Um, but I think that um, but we are going to move through these quickly because we're, Molly and I especially are interested in hearing from you the questions that you have for us. So this particular petition is um, replacing two that expire. And so if you're at General Conference, you'll note that we, our board, voted to delete the two expiring petitions in order that it be replaced with this one that's more comprehensive. And the two that we voted to delete are rape in times of war and violence against women. And what is, what is the essence of those two resolutions is absolutely included in this overall resolution petition forward. Um, and as you'll note, as I already noted, theologians, healthcare professionals from many different countries weighed in on this and gave us lots of feedback. It identifies the types of exploitation, violence, and abuse that women and girls are experiencing, um, and it also the consequences of the violence. And finally, as in good Wesleyan tradition, it calls us to think about and to understand and to advocate how it is that we're going to care for people once they're injured, but also what we're going to do to prevent injury in the first place. So this next slide you'll notice that it's all the, these are the things that are lifted up in the resolution. And they're not just named as they are on the slide. We go into in depth. So, for example, when we talk about rape, we talk about rape that happens with, by intimate partners. We also talk about rape as a weapon of war. Um, and so, so as you read these, know that, that, again, as I mentioned, it's meant to be a teaching tool that we talk about each one of these things so that people have a little bit of information about what it is we mean when we, when we lift these up. So on the list are rape, family violence, sex and labor trafficking, female genital mutilation, child marriage, vulnerable and at-risk communities, child soldiers, 
and polygamy. And Molly can probably attest to this as well. For those of us who work on these issues every day, this can be a pretty daunting list. And I imagine that as you hear this, it feels like it's pretty daunting. And so I know that one of the goals for us when we talk about abundant life is recognizing that there are that these things have a lot in common and that if we can begin breaking down some of the issues that make these things up, that create the conditions for these things to happen, that to me it feels a little less overwhelming to know that there are common roots, and so we get at the roots, then we can really take care of some of this and end what's happening. We were, some of us were just on a, there's a coalition that we're a part of here um, with different faith organizations working on human trafficking. And um, Susie Johnson, United Methodist Women, was part of that meeting with me. And one of the, the person who was speaking to the group is uh, the legislative director for the Polaris Project, which many of you have probably heard of. They run the National Trafficking Hotline. And one of the things that she said is that, that Polaris is going to work on any issue that creates vulnerability oh for women and girls. Because if, it, if, any, if something creates vulnerability for women and girls, then they are likely to be trafficked. And I think that that's how we see this, as you hear all these um, engaging in and trying to lessen the things that create vulnerability, no matter what those are. And so that, that is where we get, begin this work in an intersectional, multisexual way. Susan, I just want to hop in here really quick. If everyone can go ahead and mute your phone, we are getting a lot of background noise. So if you just joined and weren't aware, if you can use the mute button on your phone or star six, that will enable all of us to hear what Susan and Molly are saying much better. Thank you so much. This talks about the consequences. And so again, just as the previous slide, in the in the petition, we leave the, the but we also talk about them in depth. So power inequality, extreme poverty, unsafe, unplanned, or unwanted pregnancy, psychological trauma, poor physical, mental, and spiritual health, the stigma of the survivor, and lost opportunities. And so I think about, um, for example, stigma of the survivor, that, that we know that we have um, a lot of girls and women um, mostly girls who have obstetric fistula and are pushed out of their communities or people living with HIV and AIDS who are not allowed to return to their communities. And so uh, stigma is, you know, has economic consequences. So, again, as we look at this list, we know that usually um, if one of these is a consequence, most of these are a consequence for women and girls about whom we're, with whom we're working. The last slide is what our call is, and this is, um, again, we named a number of things in the petition that we hope will happen um, as a result of the, the research and the work that's been done identifying both the um, manifestations of violence and the consequences. I know that, uh, Molly, you're going to start off talking about the presence and service and examples of how that's happening, and then we'll kind of move through this list. Right. So um, our members, um, since our inception nearly 150 years ago, have been dedicated to the well-being of uh, women, children, and youth. And so um, much of our mission and advocacy work on a local, um, state, national, global level um, are about that. And so this, of course, is a really important piece to us, and and um, and again, we were happy to collaborate on this and other pieces that serve women. So, as far as presence and service, of course, our members, and if you're familiar with United Methodist Women, you know we're all about service and showing up. And so that's what our members are doing around the country in a variety of ways. Um, over the last quadrennium, we've really focused um, some of our efforts on domestic violence, which also included a strong partnership with United Methodist Men, um, and we found that. Um, you know, men in the Methodist Church um, are equally devoted to um, the, the health and safety and well-being of women and their children. And so we've done some trainings around the country 
to um, help folks figure out how to engage with their local advocacy groups and also just be present with women who are struggling. Sometimes as the church, um, we have in the past been a hindrance to people trying to escape violence. And so our work is to figure out how, how we can be of support to the agencies who are the experts and then how we can just be really present with people. And I think probably one of the most powerful things about that is in every single event that we have had around domestic violence, someone has stood up and told their story for the first time. Um, and we know that that's where healing starts. And so um, we know one place we can be is um, kind of shelter from the rain, right? So as people begin to heal, um, we can be a support there. As far as service, we, of course, our members always jump into action, creating kits for domestic violence shelters. Um, and in, in, in other arenas also, um, in a, the beginning of our maternal health initiative, there was a call for birthing kits, and they just um, – I think UMCOR was overrun with birthing kits once our members got a hold of that. So um, we not only want to be present with people, but also um, be active with people. And so finding ways to serve and support um, victims of, of not only um, domestic abuse, but also sexual assault, trafficking, you name it, our members have found ways to support in their local community and globally as well. Thank you, um, Susan, was there anything you wanted to add to presence and service, or should we move on to teaching and preaching? Right, let's move on to teaching and preaching. Okay. Um, for us, um, and, and I know that um, Susan may have some things to add, but some of the things we've done as far as teaching is, is um, it's really important. One of our core commitments is transformative education. And so in a lot of ways, we've worked to um, continually raise awareness about issues facing women. Some of those just over the last year or so, we've had um, film screenings where we've taught um, our members about the statistics in the U.S., around um, uh, maternal deaths, infant deaths, and how that looks compared to the rest of the world. We've also um, had um, some of our national mission institutions um, create events that address the infant mortality rate in their own communities. We've also had um, train the trainer events across the country for domestic violence so that um, folks can come to the training and then turn around and create uh, partnerships with local agencies and put on trainings to provide for greater awareness in their own communities. And then globally, we've also um, supported programs that train traditional birth attendants. Um, we're learning more and more about um, how that works to um, drive down the uh, maternal death rates around the world. So that's just some of the teaching we've been involved in. As far as preaching, um, in domestic violence, um, we have advocated at every event we've had for our uh, lay folk to go back and for clergy that are present to go back and talk about uh, violence against women in the church. I was raised a United Methodist and still to this day have not heard a sermon focused on domestic violence or violence against women, really. And so those are those are things that we, um, we're preaching and we're asking our clergy to preach about and talk about so that we can um, – be engaged um, in not not just uh, outside of the church walls, but but inside as well in earnest prayer and consideration of the issue. And church and society similar commitment to the transformative education and engaging people um, in having these conversations. I think I'm grateful for the Healthy Families Healthy Planet initiative, which for example has done a lot of education and. Um, advocacy, but helping to helping people become more comfortable having conversations about international family planning, for example, and why it's important when we're often not having conversations public, publicly about anything related to sexuality. Um, and so I think that there is, there is an increased comfort um, and confidence about having those conversations. And so that's an example for us of where this conversation and why we have to begin initiating these conversations. I think that one of the things I find with a lot of my colleagues who work on other issues is that we, there isn't yet a national or international dialogue that's very public. There's some, but different than um, other things that are moving around immigration or um, global warming, climate change, depending on where you are. 
that there is not as much of that happening, and so there aren't as many spaces to have conversations without that shame and stigma attached. And so one of the things that we have created um, is a series of sexual and gender-based violence pastor education resources that are context and culturally specific, and so they are um, – there are five of them. One is on HIV and AIDS. One is on family planning and reproductive health. One is on um, – sexual assault, one is on domestic violence, and one is on human trafficking. And there are some specifically for the U.S., there's a set specifically for the Philippines, and there's a set specifically for Liberia and Sierra Leone. And then because of how these issues impact communities differently, there is a set of resources for the Korean American church, the African American church, um, for Latinas, Latinas, um, and Native Americans, and they've been created in partnership and in consultation with people who are very knowledgeable about these issues within communities. So we're hopeful that these are also resources that will help encourage conversation, um, both talking about what the church says, what scripture says, but then how what needs to happen within communities for these conversations to continue. Another initiative that we have, and this is um, grown out of of my experience as a parent, but is creating a children's book initiative. And I hope many of you have found this or have seen this. And if not, we want to make sure that you do. Um, it's an initiative that has book titles, picture book titles mostly, um, with girls as protagonists in leadership roles and um, people of color in leadership roles. And what I'm conscious of um, as I – and in schools and in Sunday school classrooms is that often the books that are there don't reflect the children in our communities and don't teach our children, all of our children, that every child is made in the image of God. And so this is one of the things that we're hoping that we can begin having this conversation early on. And so on our website, there's a searchable database um, where you can choose gender, family, um, whatever it is that you're particularly looking for, because these books are really are really difficult to find um, on some of the in the major bookstores and also in um, on online bookstores as well. And then I guess one the there are two other things I want to mention. Um, one is that we've been doing a significant amount of training in Liberia with organizers there who are working to end sexual and gender-based violence, and a big part of that conversation has been healthy masculinity. Um, and engaging young people, both men and women, in both identifying and advocating for an end to um, what has become normative after the Civil War in terms of sexual assault and violence against women, and having helping to increase consciousness and comfort having the conversation about family planning um, so that women and girls can space and time pregnancies in a way that allows them to um, finish school, um, that if for some reason they experience sexual assault, that they don't have to deal um, with an unplanned pregnancy that could keep them from returning to school. Um, and then we will continue to do work around healthy masculinity. We are working currently on a partnership with um, Men Can Stop Rape and hopefully having some um, clergy soon engage in that initiative. So this is um, th this for us is a really important part of how we do eradicate uh, sexual and gender-based violence. I think that, um, Molly, you want to shift now to the advocating for systemic change? Sure. Um, so some of the things we've been engaged in, and then I'll, I'll turn it back over to Susan. Um, in uh, domestic violence, of course, our members around the country have advocated for um, gun laws that make sense around domestic violence offenders. Um, and then also one of the things we are beginning to look at is reproductive coercion and how that plays into domestic violence and how that's used and what, what we can do about it in educating our members. Um, also, um, each year our members participate in a Stop Human tra Trafficking event uh, around the Super Bowl. And so maybe you've seen our pictures. This past year we all um, had umbrellas. We've had uh, various um, themes each year. But, you know, that's one of the number one days um, of concentrated trafficking around an event. And so um, we've used that then to get our members active in their local communities. Many, like lots of us, were initially surprised to find the, uh, you know, the high prevalence of, of human trafficking in their areas. But um, there's literally no place in the U.S. or around the world that's untouched. 
So um, so they, they've worked hard on that. Moving into the next quadrennium, some of the things we're really going to be work, focusing on and working on is paid family leave um, and, and also um, the maternal death rate in the U.S., which has continued to rise, and we're going to um, be calling for maternal death review boards in cities and states that do not have them to begin to address this, um, this issue. Um, and then we also are advocating that um, just as we kind of partner with groups on a national level, that our members begin to partner with their local maternal health coalitions um, and domestic violence coalitions to address violence in their own communities. So as you know that um, Church and Society and UMW are working together on a lot of these issues, and um, we have also been talking about maternal health particularly, as I mentioned earlier, international family planning. One of the things that happens, um, the United States is the largest provider of foreign aid with respect to contraceptives globally. And there are many members of Congress who, when it comes to spending, when it comes to working on the federal budget, want to cut access and funding for international family planning. And there have been a lot of restrictions placed on this. And one of the things that we have found, and we know, and one of the reasons that we received the Healthy Family, Healthy Planet grant from the United Nations Foundation, is that often the strongest voices opposing um, the, the funding for contraceptives come from the faith community. And so there is a strong need for people of faith to say, absolutely, we support women and girls having access to contraception so they can space um, and time their pregnancies. Um, and there are lots of reasons that we know this is important. Um, we know that um, if a young girl is forced to be married and is raped, and but she is not um, has not developed um, fully, that she will not be able to pass the baby through the birth canal, and she will develop either die in labor or develop a fistula in that process. And so we want girls that still have to deal with those kinds of conditions to have access to voluntary family planning. We also um, want to make sure um, that um, that if there are um, that the that funding exists for this, um, and that it's not that kind of women's lives is not do not fully become a political football, although they are already a little bit a lot. Um, and so, you know, we are having conversations about how this is linked to human trafficking. Um, as Molly talked about the Super Bowl, one of the things that we began looking at is how a couple of years ago is what is the impact of sexual assault, um, what is the impact, what is the care needed for victims of trafficking in terms of reproductive health care? Well, I think about the unaccompanied minors, for those of you who are advocates of immigration reform, and I think about how we were so so focused on getting attorneys lined up for the young girls who are coming across the border. And the question I asked on a regular basis, well, what about the gynecologists? Who, are the, who is going to be there to provide care for these young girls? Because we know that many of them were raped in the process, were trafficked um, coming over the border. Um, and we know that there are proactive measures by family members to give these young girls contraceptives so if they were raped, they didn't become pregnant. And so I think that that's another piece of the conversation. And so, um, so for us, this is, this is part of that comprehensive conversation about when women experience violence um, or when women are put in situations or don't have the same opportunities as men because of cultural factors or economic factors, how do we make sure that women have the tools and resources needed to have abundant life? So one of the things that we're also working on is comprehensive access to reproductive health care. And you know, one of the things that for me is really important about the United Methodist Church and the social principles is that we have a really nuanced position on abortion. And I think it's a really important one that we talk about the tragic conflicts of life with life. And so as a mother of two adopted children, I am grateful that their birth mother made an adoption plan to place them for adoption. But I also know, having met one of them, that it took a tremendous amount of courage and that not every woman and girl has that kind of support that she had. Both economic support, access to health care, there are lots of things that make it a more complicated story than often gets shared. And so we, um, we want to make sure that, um, that girls who experience sexual and gender-based violence have access
access to um, terminate a pregnancy safely and legally if that is a decision that they feel is important to them. And so when I think we look at the social principles, we talk about restoring health um, after um, trauma or violence. And so how do we make sure that's available um, to a woman or girl who's had that experience? And that is, that is important for us, that we know that, um, that the church stands in that place of saying, you know, we don't support um, abortion as a form of birth control. But we do know that there are times, prayerfully and, you know, with a woman's conscience and with converse, in relationship with God and in conversation with her physician, where that may be the decision that's made. And so how do we support her in that decision-making process? Um, and so... We think about the emotional, spiritual, mental health of the woman and girl um, and what she needs to consider, just as we do in terms of family, medical care, education, um, that we consider the whole part of a woman as a spiritual being um, in, in, this, in this process. And I think that that, for me, is really important as we think about sexual and gender-based violence because already someone has this girl or this woman not fully human. Because I don't think we can that kind of violence could be perpetrated against a person who you believe is not fully human. And so to me, to deny whatever the care is, counseling, um, post-exposure prophylaxis, if she is at risk of getting AIDS from the sexual assault or violence, um, unplanned pregnancy for emergency contraception, whatever it is, um, how do we tell her in that moment as a church that she is a beloved child of God, that she's made an image of God, and we want to do everything that we can to make sure that she gets to live out the life that God intended. Um, and so, so that, is part of, that is part of this conversation for us as well. Um, Molly, did you have anything else that you wanted to add before we open it up for questions? Um, no, one thing I do want to mention um, is, is we are right there with um, GBCS and, and their affirmation of the church's position. Um, our board, um, their most recent policy around this was reproductive freedom for all women, which affirmed um, our strong support for reproductive health and freedom for all women, both in the U.S. and around the world. And it's part of our historic commitment to women's health. And so um, that's that's one thing I want to mention. And I also want to say, you know, because some, some feedback we got from our, our folks around the world was, you know, well, what about boys? What about boys? Um, when when we make things better for women, we make things better for boys, too, um, uh, for girls and boys and their whole family. And so um, we know statistically that when women are able to um, get an education and make some choices um, and, and put off childbirth until later, they, they are better mothers, they're better prepared mothers, and they raise stronger children. So um, to build strong communities, th this is the place to start. It's to build strong women. Um, and so um, that's some of the feedback we've heard. And there are other resolutions that talk about that, child soldiers and so on, but uh, about little boys but um, and the girl child about little girls. So, um, But I just wanted to lift up that um, when we address these issues, we are also uh, strengthening boys and girls. Absolutely. And I think when we talk about, Molly, thank you for mentioning that, when we talk about the engaging men as allies and, and teaching healthy masculinity, is that exactly that? How do we... Um, how do we create spaces for boys to feel like they can be equal partners in, um, in the raising of families or in parenting, um, and that there are other ways to interact with the community besides having power over or dominating. Um, and often those options aren't necessarily given, aren't provided. Or aren't so we want to um, take some questions. Um, if you would, yes, so Trisha is reminding us um, that if you would please mute your phone, that would be really helpful. So the if you to mute it, it's um, star six. No. So this is Trisha. There is someone on the phone. Hopefully, um, if everyone can just double check that you're muted, there's someone that's speaking in the background. So we want to be sure that if you are not intending to speak to everyone, that your line is muted so that we don't hear you in the background. Um, but I want to turn it back over to Susan to open it up for questions. Thank you. Great. Um, so if you would, it would be helpful for us if you would ask a question um, and then um, – 
and then mute your phone again using star six. Linda, I saw that you have a particular question about reproductive health, but I didn't see your the specific question. Could you ask that? Can you tell us anything about the teaching tools you have? Yes, ma'am. The series on sexual and gender-based violence? Is that the series you mentioned? You mean? Is that on the national website for United Methodist Women? Okay. So, Molly, do you want me to respond first and then you can respond next? Yeah, that'll be great. Okay. So, I'm, I forgot to mention that we have a new video that we just got um, uh, made called Growing Up Girl. And it is um, a short video. I think it's two minutes long, two and a half minutes long. And it looks at essentially what we've talked about in this resolution, but more fully about the things that are really necessary to grow up a girl. And so we are, re we are kind of creating a, a web page that will allow you to access the resources more fully about all the issues we're working on related to abundant life. And this will be the center of it. Um, and so I'm excited that will be up soon. Um, but that video, I think, hopefully will be another teaching tool that you can show um, in a, in a uh, small conversation or in your Sunday school classroom to begin the conversation about what it is, what's important in terms of, in terms of ensuring abundant life for women and girls. Um, the sexual and gender-based violence resources that exist um, will be on the website as well. Um, and so those are specifically focused on, I think if some of you have seen our faith and facts cards that list, that talk about what scripture says, what the church says, what the facts are and then what people can do. This is a bit of an expanded version where we do some more uh, theological work with the scripture um, as well as thinking, as well as kind of putting a little bit more um, detail and ideas around what it looks like um, to engage in this work. And so, you know, we've got feedback, for example, from an, uh, an organization that works on domestic violence within Korean American communities. And so on those, for the Korean American resources, there are specific examples um, that are important for the work that they do that are community specific. Um, same thing for the Native American resources, et cetera, that, that we really wanted to make sure that, that we weren't creating a one-size-fits-all resource, but something that would be um, relevant within uh, each person's community or context. So uh, for United Methodist Women, um, we have um, – a couple of things that, that I think would be useful. Um, in the area of domestic violence, we have a, a, a large section of our website devoted to domestic violence with a variety of resources, some that you can borrow from our office and some that you can also find online um, that can be used to have programs for teaching. We've also trained a fair number of people in um, how the faith community responds to domestic violence, so we can also connect you with someone um, nearby, hopefully, that, that can help you in that endeavor. Um, it, we've also, uh, our Mission U program, which I'm sure lots of people are familiar with, um, every year we address new topics, and this year um, our spiritual growth study is um, human sexuality in the Bible, and I think it's really important that this is a spiritual growth study and not an issue study. Um, so often it's easy to kind of divorce our own sexuality um, from uh, from our spiritual selves, right? And so this talks about um, women in the Bible and uh, many of the issues we've discussed um, and how they tie into our spiritual being. So um, I think it's a really good study, and I encourage you to take advantage of it. Um, you can contact your local UMW to find out when their Mission U is this summer. And, of course, those resources are also available on our website um, if you're not able to go to Mission U, you can certainly still take advantage of reading the book and, and seeing the material. Um, someone has also asked about um, if, if UMW wants to plan a workshop for teens, do we need parental permission? Um, I, I think that while there's not um, – we don't have a particular rule about that. Um, in most instances, I think when you are going to talk particularly with your uh, teens in your church um, – Having a good understanding with parents about exactly what that will involve, I think, is useful. Um, but it's also important that teens get information. So I know it's a tough balance, and I wish that I had an easy answer. But um, in general, I think it is useful and helpful and healthy for parents to also engage in this discussion. Um, and it will hopefully open some lines of communication there. Um, one thing we know as far as driving down the birth rate is um, that when we teach self-worth, 
um, girls and boys are less likely to um, engage in behavior that will give them a false sense of security or love. So um, if we're talking about um, that sort of thing, I think you can infuse everything you do with the idea that um, – that teens are uh, beloved children of God. Um, but if we're talking about um, real information or, or you know, the kinds of things when someone perhaps is in a situation, then, you know, I think that you have to um, use your best judgment and, and do the best you can. But with workshop planning, it's, it's usually something you can talk to the parents about and kind of have an understanding. And, and then, you know, outside of UMW and, and GBCS, I mean, we do have some great resources in the UMC, including a, a new curriculum from um, discipleship um, around these issues. And I think they would have some of the tips and some of the um, uh, details about planning that I think would be very useful. So they've shared that with us, and um, I, think it, I think some of the modules are already available. There's a, I wonder, there's a sp more of a specific question around um, provision of effective birth control and access. And I think that one of the things that we've been having a conversation with, because a lot of our ambassadors, Healthy Family, Healthy Planet ambassadors, have been very much focused on international family planning and, and working with members, their members of Congress, um, both in their home districts and, in, and here on Capitol Hill, to advocate for that funding. And I think that one of the pieces that people have been yearning for is a conversation about how this is an issue in the local communities. And so we were in South Carolina, Pauline and I were in South Carolina last week um, with a group of folks that are working locally and, and very aware that in their communities there is not access. They're in a state where Medicaid has not been expanded, and the highest rates of infant and maternal mortality are in, within the African-American community the highest rate of HIV AIDS in terms of increase in rates. Um, and so, and partially because there is an access to, to um, health care. And so one of the things that I think would be great um, is that if we have, as a church could become, in, in local communities, become more conscious of where it is that if people do not have access to health insurance, which so many people do not, or employers who aren't willing to provide it, if we knew how to point people in that direction and to have those conversations about what is effective. Um, one of the things that we found when we were uh, working on the Hobby Lobby decision and kind of having those conversations around that court case is that we were particularly concerned about workers, um, that, you know, a minimum wage worker, what we found was that it would, it would cost a minimum wage worker a month's salary to purchase an IUD which is we know IUDs, intrauterine devices, are the most effective form of birth control. But if you don't have health insurance and you're a minimum wage worker, it would cost a month's salary to do that. And so I think we can all understand that that's pretty unreasonable. And so, again, what is our role in having these conversations locally as well as internationally? Are there other questions? You can, How is you, this what I'm there connected with the general conference? What are you presenting there about this topic? So we will not be presenting. So, well, we actually don't. This is um, this is one of the things that's great about our church is that our board members worked really hard on these resolutions and with us um, as staff, and now they are in the hands of general conference delegates. And so we will not have a place to have a formal um, convert or presentation. Um, we both, both United Methodist Women and Church and Society have events that are, are taking place. The Global AIDS Fund has an event um, on Monday the 9th where there will be some different conversations related to HIV AIDS, uh, preventing mother to child transmission and the role of contraception and, and that sort of thing there. But in terms of a conversation the way we're having it right now, that will probably be one-on-one -on -one with delegates who, who ask us questions about the legislation as they're working on it. Yeah, and, and both of our agencies, along with other agencies and annual conferences and churches and individuals, have introduced a variety of petitions that, um, that, that address some of these issues. Of course, this one is, um, you know, eradicating sexual and gender-based violence. Um, but on our website, and I know that on Church and Society's website, you can see all of our petitions that we are um, 
that we we have submitted those were submitted some time ago and so um but but some ones that also kind of lift up these issues for us are the girl child um status of women responsible parenthood um environmental health so it's addressed in many places because as we know um these all of these issues that face women kind of intersect somewhere so um there are lots of intersections and those are reflected in a variety of resolutions and I and I am. Pardon me. That's great. Also, thank you for mentioning and supporting uh, Mission U and uh, Spiritual Growth Study on you know the Bible and human sexuality. A bunch of us are interested in taking it this summer. Yeah, it's a really exciting study, and um, we are looking forward to the fantastic conversation that is going to foster around the country. And I think that you know. Um, People are, are nervous about it because we always get nervous when we talk about these issues, but it's important conversation that we need to have. So it's, um, I think, going to be a really good study. Yeah, I'm excited about it. And if are there any other questions? No, but I'm proud of United Methodist Women that they're tackling women's health. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. Well, thank you. I will certainly pass that along. <laughs> And um, we are um, supporting Susanna's house, which is in Knoxville, Tennessee, and um, we're trying to get them to be a national mission with United Women. But they're working with young moms that are addicted to opiates, and they're trying to help uh, get them to be off of the opiates so that they can have healthy babies and be a healthy mom and keep their child. And um, that that is a service that's needed a lot more. Um, probably all over our country, but especially in the southeast, uh, where open addiction is, you know, really a bad problem. Absolutely. One of the things, of the things that, that I'm hoping will come of this, and and you know, we are we are, we wanted to have this conversation, Molly and I, um, leading up to general conference because it is going to be so much. There's going to be so much conversation there about all of these issues. Um, and not everybody will be able to participate in those conversations in the same way, although we hope that you'll um, either watch um, via um, through the Internet or be in communication conversation with some of your friends and colleagues and church members who will be there as delegates. Um, but, you know, we're hoping that this will be an ongoing conversation because the issues that we've named throughout this, are so prevalent and, and in some communities becoming worse. And so we know as people of faith that we've got to continue to have the conversation and we've got to continue raising it and identifying effective ways to engage people in mobilizing for change. And so we're hoping that, um, that this is just one step, the general conference is one step um, in a journey that gets us on board to really, really strongly and strategically I advocate for the end of oppression of women and girls. Hi, this is Irma Clark, and I just want to say to Susan and Molly, thank you so much for this because we need this in the states here as well because we have so many of our kids and also the parents who are unaware and they are somewhat like blind to this, and the parents come out when we do sessions uh, regarding uh, sexuality, and the parents are there to learn as well so that they can be better parents and help their children to be uh, even uh, better kids. Uh, one thing I work with my pastor on was the um, the confirmation class, and we did a little bit about human sexuality and that. And what she wanted me to talk about was, uh, you know, human sexuality among girls and boys and et cetera, et cetera. And the parents were there, and they were so eager to learn. So this is going really well, and this is a uh, confirmation class, but working well with the young men and the young women. Irma, that's wonderful, and I think you bring up a really good point. Um, you know, when you become a parent, you don't magically have all the answers about sexuality and uh, all the things that made you a parent, right? So um, we make an assumption about adults that because they're adults and they have had children or are become parents in some way that, that then they can have this conversation with their kids. Well, it, it takes an equal amount of education with uh, adults um, on how to talk with their kids. Most of us 
um, even in, in – although my, as the generations go on, maybe it gets better. But most of us probably didn't get a very comprehensive education from our parents. We learned it somewhere else, right? So, um, so I think it's an important role that the church can play in serving parents and how they become comfortable in talking about these issues and serving kids. And it can be a safe place. I know for myself, I was lucky enough to have comprehensive sex education at my church. And so it, it put a spin and a, a spiritual dimension on sexual sexuality education that I would not have gotten in a public school or in a girl's bathroom at school, which is where a lot of us learn about sexuality, or, you know, a variety of other places, TV, media, all of that. My core first important information came from my church. And so um, we want to give folks the tools to do that. Thank you so much. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Excellent job. Thanks for this webinar. Yeah, I think some of these tools should be shared with pastors all over our country, some of the United Methodist Church, because um, of using it even with confirmation training, but also um, the youth leaders of all the churches, too, would benefit from knowing about some of the teaching tools that we have. And, and I think you know, one of the wonderful things about being a connectional church is that we do have a sense of who all the folks are, who all the people are who are involved in the churches and in youth group leadership. What I know is that, and what I hear from pastors and from youth leaders, is that they get so many resources and they're not sure where to start. And I know that it, when someone comes to me and says, I want you to check this out, I'm more likely to spend time doing that um, than if I get a, an email Um in the midst of lots of other emails. So I would ask each of you to have begin having these conversations um, with the leadership at your church and also within with your members of Congress, that, that we need to be having these conversations um, at a local level, at a grassroots level, to really push this dialogue forward. Amen. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts for us, ideas for us to consider as we? There's some background noise. Um, I'm wondering if we could, Molly, what if you think if we close in prayer? That sounds great. Would you like to do the honors? Or do you like oh, me? yes, I'll be glad to. <laughs> Lord, we come to you asking your wisdom, your guidance, your support as we continue to work to end oppression against women and their children and in, in essentially their entire family. Um, guide us as a church, as a faith community, and as individuals to um, engage in that work. As we go into general conference, um, we pray that um, that we keep these principles in mind, that, um, that, that all are your beloved, precious children. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being part of this, and we will send the um, email out with the link so that you can follow up and share it with other people as well. Thank, Thank you. you.